I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. What is Celebrity Memoir Book Club? Because I want the people to know before they sit down for possibly 80, 90 minutes of their lives. It's important to know, first of all, that once you sit down, this cannot be paused. We are a runaway train, baby. And on that train, we've got a... That's not true, Ashley. Don't start with a lie. (laughs) It literally could pause at any time. And on that train, that cannot be stopped. We've got a fat stack of books that you're like, listen, I'm on a runaway train. I don't have don't, time I to think read. You, I don't think that this is going to be helpful. I'm going to tell them as two best friends and comedians reading the book so that you don't have to. If you want to read the books, we recommend it. If you hate us, I hope you never have to hear from us again. But if you love us, Ashley will be thanking our five-star reviewers at the end. So come on board and good luck. This week, I'd also like to thank the fun and challenging June's Journey game. Who doesn't love a good mystery? In the hidden object murder mystery game, June's Journey, you'll awaken your inner sleuth and step right into a thrilling adventure set in the heart of the roaring 20s. Find your inner detective and download June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. And thank you to Dipsy for supporting Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Dipsy is an audio app full of short, sexy stories. If you're looking to light a spark or heat things up, there's a story waiting for you. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash worm. And thank you to Freshly for supporting Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Freshly has delicious, fresh, healthy meals ready to heat and enjoy in just three minutes. Stop stressing about dinner right now. You can get $125 off your first five orders at freshly.com slash worm. Claire. Yes. How are things heating up for you this week? They are good. If I were to name my chapter, it would be called Back at the Bottom. Great. Because as you guys may or may not know, I fancy myself to be a stand-up comedian. And as of recently, I've had to kind of swallow the pill that if you're not doing stand-up comedy, you're probably not a stand-up comedian. And basically, this is going to be boring and like very in the weeds of comedy. But after the pandemic, I tried to get back into open mics and shows, but things had changed a lot and I just didn't have it in me to like relearn the landscape. So I tried to do only shows thinking that that would be enough stage time in a week. And it really wasn't very much stage time. But every time I try to go back to open mics, I was like, I just can't. I've been doing this too long. I can't go back to year one, level one BS. And then I was like, you know what? I'll just write it out. The podcast is getting bigger. Pretty soon people will book me because they'll be like, oh, well, she has something that's going well in her life. We'll book her off the back of that. And then it turned out actually nobody has done that. And now I'm just not getting booked ever and I'm not getting on stage. And so then the one time a month I do go on stage to do stand up, it's at our show. And I dread it because I don't want to do old material, but I don't have anything new that I'm proud of. And it's made stand up this very like complicated thing that makes me stressed and unhappy. And it is something I love doing. And I kind of was at a fork in the road where I was like, well, I can either say, I guess I don't do stand up anymore and let it go and say I have all these other creative outlets and I'm very lucky and I'm happy And that's just not part of my life anymore, but it was part of my journey. Or I can say, okay, Claire, if you really want to continue this, you kind of have to just suck it up and go back to the bottom. And I have decided I think I'm going to have to go back to the bottom. And I will be going to open mics where men who started last year will be condescending and put me last and try to explain to me how the stand-up world in New York City works and come up to me after a set and go, hey, that was actually pretty funny. And I'll have to look them dead in the eyes and go, you have never in your life made anybody laugh. Do not speak to me. Like, I need your fucking approval. But <laughs> but I'd love to do your bar show on Thursday. Yeah, you've got a spot open and it's going to be a lot of just sitting in a bar and watching people think they're reinventing the wheel because they're doing comedy with no punchlines, which they think is all indifferent, but really just fucking sucks. And hear NYU kids talk about semester abroads that they think are relevant to everybody's life. And it's gonna suck but it's gonna suck in a way that I truly miss and I if I don't do it then I have to admit I've quit and I think I would rather go through that shit than not have it in my life anymore but maybe I come back in three weeks and go actually I don't miss it that much I lied to myself (laughs) I have a complete notion of myself that's built on a farce so I don't know but I think I'm ready to eat some humble pie and say you know what sometimes to do the things you love you got to do some things that suck that's where I'm at is humble pie just a saying or is it a food I literally won't answer that Ashley how was your week (laughs) And a band. What would be in a (laughs) slice of humble pie? What would the ingredients be, Ashley? I don't know. What the fuck is turtle pie? There's not turtles in it. (gasps) Mud pie? Not mud. (laughs) Don't act like I'm stupid. (laughs) Okay. I would title my (laughs) chapter of my memoir this week, Pick Stuff That Makes You Happy. I feel like every couple weeks you're like, did you know that hanging out with your friends and doing things you like puts you in a good mood? Okay, because here's the thing. Tell me. Is I feel like I will attend things that I feel pressure to attend on a very regular basis. 
And it all goes back to wedding season as everything in my life does right now. I used to love weddings and I still love weddings. I feel like getting caught up in the hustle and the bustle of all the events and all the things has been very stressful to me this year. And I'm like happy for all of my friends, but then I'm personally very stressed out. And I've decided to really start picking and choosing the things that will only help me like bring joy to my friends events and not make me a stressed person that is just like a miserable little bitch all the time. Mm -hmm. Like wedding showers. This is the big discovery that I had this week. I had so much fun going to my friend's bachelorette party. I love celebrating my friends and what makes them happy. But a wedding shower itself is a horrible event. I hate a wedding shower and I feel bad because my mom was on the planning committee and they work so hard. And I'm not just just one, but all of them. She is the capital P, capital C, capital W planning committee of weddings. (laughs) Yes. They do such a good job making them as good as possible. But like the overall structure of the event is not a thing that I enjoy literally in any way. It's like a structured luncheon where like you're sitting at a table and there's too many activities for you to even talk. If you want to socialize with the people that are there, you can't even because you get there and you have five minutes to talk and then you have to like sit down in your assigned seat and listen to speeches. No, thank you. This is a horrible time. I, we need to get rid of it. And I am officially retiring from wedding showers. I will never attend one again. And that will make me happier. I am happy for my friends and I want to celebrate them. And I will do so at a bachelorette, at a wedding, et cetera. A shower is nonsense. And I refuse to stand by it any longer. I also do agree that I'm like, what, what is a shower? It's your grandma telling you about sex for the first time. I know. <laughs> And I'm sorry if I've offended any of the people whose showers I'm invited to and have attended recently. (laughs) But I love you. I'm excited for you. The shower's not fun for me. (laughs) I listen. We can't all enjoy everything. (laughs) This week, we have the redemption narrative of a lifetime. Someone who deserves to be showered with love and praise. We have a perfectly imperfect, self-aware, honest story of divine intervention, finding God. And taco entrepreneurship. We have Danny Trejo's, what's the book called? I think it's just called Trejo. (laughs) Okay, it's just called Trejo. That's why I didn't really know what it was called. Okay, we have Danny Trejo's Trejo. So Danny Trejo was born May 14th, 1944. So as you are thinking, he is old as pie. So Danny Trejo's birthday was May 14th, 1944. He is currently 78. At time of writing, this book came out in 2021. So he was 76, 77. You guys can do that math, no? Someone can do math. No one here, but someone out there. The book is written fairly out of order. It's a bit tricky. There's five sections and each section like starts at the end of the section and then works itself backwards. So we are going to do our best to get you guys the gist of this book. I will say it's a great book. Like all men's books is written in an extraordinary detail. I don't know how men can't remember your birthday, ladies, but can remember every single car they were ever sitting in and every person who was ever there and every punch they ever threw dating back to World War II times. Yeah, but can I give our pal Danny a little bit more credit? Because in this book, I don't feel like the detail was excruciating in the way I found it in other books. Because a lot of times the detail is like a setup to honor someone he's known or to tell like just honestly a story that's very silly. Yeah, that's what I would call this book. I would call this a silly book. (laughs) There are very silly moments and I loved that about it. (laughs) There are some that are overdone, but the book still comes in under 300 pages. Oh no. It's not like Anthony Kiedis where I'm just like, shut the fuck up. No, I meant it as I do think more men than women add these intense details and it does follow that trend. That being said, I think this book is worth reading. All of the details are incredibly fascinating. This is a book of a man who you go, well, he should have written a book. Yes. If you knew him, you'd go, you need to write a book, dude. (laughs) Yeah. And I do think it's a book that just does justice to himself. It gets his story across. I think it does justice to a lot of people in his life who were dealt a hand where their story might not have been heard. But that being said, we are trying to give you guys the larger picture. We're trying to give you just the meat of a Trejo's taco and not the fluffy contents of a Trejo's Donut. Okay. So the book opens, chapter one, Soledad, 1968. I feel like shit. I was high on heroin, pruno, reds, and whiskey. Pruno, for those who don't know, is jail wine. I was three years into a 10-year stretch, which for a Mexican was more likely to be a 20-year stretch, a life stretch, a death stretch. I'd always figured I would die in prison. And then he goes on to tell a story that we're going to circle back to later. 
So at this point, he opens the book with this thought that he is about to die in prison. And that was his mindset at this age of 22, 23. He spent most of his childhood getting in and out of prison. And that's what this first section is all about. I think he went away for the first time when he was 14. Yes. At first, he started in juvie when he was 14 years old. Then he went up to a youth training school, which he calls prep schools, whereas prep schools would go to college. YTS is for getting people into regular prison. It really trained you to understand how to work the regular system. So he'd get out for a few weeks, a couple months, then he'd be sent right back in. And at this point, he had been sent through the system and he was now at one of the most dangerous, intense prisons in California. The first time I got hauled off to a police station, I was 10. By 12, I was a regular juvenile hall. So, okay, so I guess 12. Not 14. The first time I got hauled off to a police station, I was 10. Yeah. I've been locked up in and out, but mostly in since 1956. For 12 years, I put to use everything I learned from my uncle Gilbert about being incarcerated. The first time I got taken to Eastlake Juvenile Hall, I remember saying to myself, what did Gilbert teach me? So Gilbert was his uncle who he cherished. Gilbert was also in and out of the prison system for his entire life and really took Danny under his wing. His father was always present. He always lived with his dad and his dad was always there, but he talks a lot throughout this book about how his dad was kind of a father figure to everyone in the neighborhood, but him never said, I love you never really showed affection. It was a very odd relationship. It was very cold in the home and all he ever really wanted was to feel loved by his dad. So he kind of goes backwards through each of the previous prisons he had been in. He was in and out of juvenile hall throughout his tween and teenage years. When he wasn't in juvie, he was just getting kicked out of high schools. So one of the reasons he ended up there is because there was no high school that would take him. He was finally at North Hollywood High School. And this is just a story that really illustrates the amount of rage and lack of fear in him. He says, I wasn't scared of being busted. I wasn't scared of being locked up. And when a kid loses fear of consequences, that's when society has lost them. So he's at North Hollywood High School. A couple of kids try to mess with him. One of the kids is like, let's just pick this up after school. And he's like, well, then I had the entire day for my rage to build. A bunch of kids approached him and he bit a kid's face off. And then he goes across the street to whatever restaurants across the street and grabs a meat cleaver and starts running at everybody with a meat cleaver. And he's like, something Gilbert had always taught me is you have to come crazy. Let everybody know that they should be afraid to fight you. Like go for the eyeballs, bite someone, make them afraid. No one dared take a step towards me. That's the power of crazy. That's the power of being willing to go to a place unimaginable to your foes. But that kind of power comes with a cost. By exercising it, you reveal to the world that the only place you belong is a state penitentiary. And so he's constantly getting put in jail for that. He's coming out. Another time he gets into a fight with this kid where he slashes him with a broken bottle. And when he comes to court, the guy is in a naval suit and his face is completely covered in bandages. And so he gets sent back. One of these times he gets out and he meets this girl. They start hooking up and they get married for some reason. He gets thrown back in jail. She divorces him in jail. As soon as he leaves, he calls his friend Frankie. And he's like, what do I do? I'm 21 years old. I don't want to live like this anymore. And his friend Frankie goes, you have to get sober. They had done juvie together. And he's like, I'm sober. You have to get sober. He takes him to a meeting. He tricks him to go to a meeting by saying that there will be girls there. Yeah. So he actually went to his first meeting on the inside with Frank. And Frank said, come to a meeting with me. There will be girls there. And so that's why he starts going. And then outside of jail, Frank is the person he calls. And Frank is like, all right, let's start going to meetings again. He gets 29 days sober before he ends up going on a bender because he just was in a bad mood and walked into a bar. And of course it was hard to hold himself back. That bender turned into three weeks with this guy, Dennis, where they're robbing liquor stores. They're selling guns for heroin. And it's a lot of cons too. They're like robbing other criminals. So like they're making a lot of enemies. And finally, Dennis, who's an idiot, he's like a white boy idiot, is like, oh, I found this incredible guy who will give us $2,000 cash for heroin. And so they fill up balloons of heroin with sugar. And Danny's like, these idiots will never know the difference. And of course, Danny's like, I knew something was off immediately. The people they sold all the drugs to were police. He actually went to court twice. And because it was sugar, they didn't have a case on him. And then the other thing he did is, first of all, he didn't take his hands off the steering wheel during the whole deal. Then he immediately went to a friend and had them switch out the money for different bills. So they had technically only sold $2,000 worth of sugar. And they also couldn't prove that he had the cash. He was just the driver during this drug deal. So then he was like, we're going to get off. This is no big thing. And then Dennis flipped on him. And sent him to jail for 10 years. And that's when he gets put into the intense penitentiaries. That's when the woman he was married to, the first of many, sends him divorce papers. And that's when he gets sent to the place where he thinks he's going to die. And the thing about Danny, though, is he, because of Gilbert, always knew the lay of the land when it came to prison. 
So he was like an expert at kind of just like getting in there, establishing his place. He was really good at figuring out a racket and just running it. So he had been a trained boxer. When he had been trained by a cousin of his, Gilbert, and then somebody else he knew. And he'd always just been practicing. And because he was good at this and because he knew inherently prison politics, wherever he went, he was treated with respect. And I think like Gilbert and his family had a name that like preceded him. So wherever he went, he was able to come in and offer people protection. At one of these places, he was able to box, not professionally, but professionally for the inmates. And that curried him favor with the guards at one of the places. And then the other thing that really served him well was that Gilbert had raised him to never be a bully. And he made it clear that in prison, it's kill or be killed. You have to be a predator or a prey. And he knew the deal. And he said, always make the first move. Someone can come back from a punch, but they can't come back from a stab. And never beat up on somebody weaker than you. And something about Danny that comes out from an early age is that he really wants to look out for the people that are weaker than him. And he's always offering like free protection to really the bottom people who need it the most. At one point when he's in the youth training service, He gets to fight fires and he loves that. He says, the most important thing about the youth fire camps is that they made us feel like heroes. We would actually joke around and stand like we were Superman with our hands on our hips saying, dun, dun, dun. Fighting fires was the first real lesson we delinquents got in building self-esteem. And so he always takes with him this sense of fairness, I would say. Yeah, I mean, okay, so here's the thing is there is like an inherent code. Mm -hmm. He has respect within the system because he respects the system. And I don't mean the system in terms of like jail itself. I mean like the culture within jail. Yeah. Prison politics. Prison politics. And so he's always just very much working within it. He respects the shot callers. He really understands how things work and he's not trying to rock the boat. He's just trying to protect himself and whoever else he can. But the other thing he does in this book is make it very clear that this is not some glamorous fun frat. He talks when he gets out how every man deep down wants to know how they would fare in jail. And he's like, it's so fucked up of a question because he's like, you don't ever like who you are in jail. And this idea that you show up, you punch the strongest guy in the room and then all of a sudden everyone respects you and leaves you alone. He goes, that's not how it works. You either become a monster who kills people or you have horrible atrocities committed to you. And he's like, and there is no exact playbook for how to do it. He talks about this white kid who comes in and two men try to rape him. And so he like, beats the shit out of them and they're both Mexican. And so then two days later, he's found with his throat slit in his jail cell by the Mexican mafia of the jail. So he did everything he was told you were supposed to do to protect yourself and it got him literally murdered in two days. So stop pretending that there's some way you could go in and be like the alpha of the group. If you are, you don't like what it makes you. Yeah, so he talks about first getting to San Quentin and he says violence and death shimmered in the air at San Quentin like heat distortion above a desert highway. I was sitting in B section a few days later when I heard a guy screaming. A guard was running after him, his feet pounding the floor, and I heard him yell, halt, halt. Then he shot the inmate right there in the hallway of the block, a very loud crack. Everything went quiet. Sonny and George were in B section with me, and I yelled, he shot him, but it came out weirdly high-pitched and weak. I immediately dropped my voice and said to the vato in the cell next to me, Beto, he said, fuck you. And then he mimicked me in a girl's voice. He shot him. He shot him. And then uh, like for days, everyone's making fun of Danny Trejo for like being alarmed that he had just witnessed someone get shot. And that was his first day in there. And that was after years of juvie and other prisons. And he later talks about when he got in there, someone had a hit out on him because on the outside, he claims his partner had killed his partner. And so this guy was going to kill Danny as revenge. And he saw him coming. And right as he was about to get stabbed and murdered, his friend stabbed him in the back three times. And he goes, a man was dead on the stairwell around the corner from my cell and I didn't care. It was him or me and he had brought it on. Enough time in prison and it starts to shape your mind. The violence, the will to survive, what's funny and the value of one man's life. He really does a good job talking about how harrowing it is, how you become this person who has to always live in the moment because you never know when you're going to die. You assume every day you might die. And if you're not on high alert at all times, you will die. He does a really good job of talking about the way that like who you are in jail is just a completely different person. Like you said earlier, there is this mentality that you have to put on. And if you don't, you're in danger. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't become a different person, then you're leaving yourself vulnerable. And the worst thing you can do is have any signs of vulnerability. Another story about playing dominoes and he had some, I don't really understand dominoes, but whatever the equivalent of a full house was. (laughs) And as he was about to play his domino hand, the guy next to him gets stabbed and he was still playing his turn as this man is like dying and bleeding out in front of him. And so his friend grabs him. He's like, we got to get out of here. It's going to get worse. And he's furious. And he goes, when I got back to my cell, I was in a rage. I was holding on to the blood soaked dominoes so hard. They almost cut my hand. I thought, what kind of animal have I become? What kind of animal have I become? 
So like we said, though, he is out there trying to help people. Like, So one of his main rackets is protection. So he would get there. He had a whole system set up that he describes later where someone would come to the prison brand new. He would be like, do you want my protection services? They would be like, nah, I'll figure it out. He had some of his boys corner them in the showers. And then he would come in later and be like, get out of here, boys. <laughs> and then the guy would be like, actually, I do want your protection. And he'd be like, that's what I fucking thought. And so he was really, I think, the leader of the Mexicans protection system. He says he wasn't part of the Mexican mafia, but he knew to be friends with them because being part of their crew is an entire. Well, I think there's like the Mexican mafia and then there's like the Mexicans in prison. Yes. So he was within the Mexicans, very powerful and respected. He kind of got along with everybody. He knew not Mm -hmm. to rock the boat. People knew what he was about. And also because he was a good boxer, he was respected. And then also, as you'll see in this situation, He gets put to use a lot. A lot of the prisoners work the prison, which is like a weird truth that I've learned from this book and others of people who have been in jail. So he gets put in charge of incoming delivery systems, which meant that he was basically at the forefront of all the drug deals that were coming in. And a lot of drugs get funneled into prison. And so he had his pick of the heroin. And so he basically was the head dealer of the prison. So he was making money as a protector. He was making money running drugs. He said he was doing quite well. He was sending money home to his mom. Yeah, he was like supporting people on the outside. Yeah, anyways. And he was put in charge by the people in charge. He said, for the guards, there was a huge value to having someone like me, someone who would stand up for the vulnerable. It helped regulate the prison. It also ensured that the people under protection would not try to do stupid shit on their own. Once you were protected, you couldn't act bad or start shit because you would be cut loose. Yeah, so he talks about this one guy that he protected kind of pro bono. He said this kid just came in. He was weak. He had no money. And he said that he had hypnotic powers. A couple days later, the guy told me that he could get us high And so they decided to try it. And he says, if that white boy wasn't a career criminal, he could have been a professional hypnotist, someone who went to high schools and state fairs and got people to come on stage and act like cats and stuff. But he was, in fact, a career criminal. He was Charles Manson. He then goes on to say that inside Manson worked alone, the elaborately constructed social structure we Mexicans had was something denied him, even by his fellow white prisoners. Men fight to the death in prison over the gang they're in, but the different ethnic groups also cooperate with each other more than people think. It's the way we keep order. If someone fucks up and owes a debt or fucks with people and causes problems, it is up to the gang to regulate them. Prison gang life eluded Charles Manson, and even if he could have fallen into it, he sure as shit wouldn't have been the leader. It was only after he got out that he was able to create the social structure he wanted by finding a bunch of lost hippies in hate Ashbury and making them into a family. I love being like, oh yeah, that guy who drove to murder? He, he wasn't shit where I'm from. <laughs> I mean, he also grapples with his own position within the prison. He's like, am I scamming people or doing them a favor? The truth is, whether it came from me or someone else, this is what was awaiting him. He needs structure and protection or he's never going to survive. So it is this weird system of like, yeah, obviously it's all a mess. But like, this is the ecosystem. Yeah, you can't not be a part of it. So he's describing all this and, you know, he has his life cut out for him. It's miserable. He's horrible. I mean, he hates it there. He talks about how fucking brutal and dehumanizing it can be but all hell breaks loose one day when they're doing a this baseball is, team i didn't okay I okay didn't, a baseball team comes to the prison for an exhibition match against prisoners and would you guys believe that it goes badly it's also cinco de mayo and danny trejo is like to bring outsiders in on cinco de mayo a day that everyone is just absolutely fucked up no matter what they're all just on heroin prune wine what's it called prune. No. <laughs> I mean, it's just a mess. So there's a riot, essentially, is what happens. He says that- Over gum. Over gum. He says, of all the things I can get us in prison, literal heroin, I cannot get us gum. A riot breaks out. Before he's able to leave, somebody gets hit in the head with a rock. He gets blamed for attacking a corrections officer by throwing a rock. Mm -hmm. He says he didn't do it. So he gets sent to solitary confinement where then he will be placed on death row. And so he is awaiting murder. Yes. While he is in there, he gives up all hope and he wants to find God, but he struggles because he's like, the only God I know is the God that I was taught in Catholicism and that's not a God I can subscribe to. Then he says, I was taught that God answers every prayer, even if his answer is no. The only prayer that had stuck with me my whole life, the prayer that hit me like a rock in the chest when I learned it in the catechism was the prayer of St. Francis. Let me not seek to be consoled as to console. In that cell, I asked God for help and his answer was help. I understood. Help others. That's what people used to say in the meetings I went to. You can't keep grace unless you give it away, they said. You have to be of service to others. Even if they don't get it, you will. I assume my answer from God was just to help my fellow inmates because I figured I was dead in five years. In that cell, God killed the old me, made me a new Danny Trejo and said, now let's see what you can do with him. When I went into the hole, I was shooting three or four grams of heroin a day. I was doing 10, 15 pills a day. 
I was drinking every day. Any kick off heroin with no access to methadone is brutal. And in prison, there was no access to methadone. Since I'd given up pills at the beginning of the time of the hole around Cinco de Mayo, and it took me a few months to get clean, August 23rd is the day I chose as my sobriety date. So August 28th, he's released from the hole. And a year later, he gets out of prison. And basically what happens is nobody in jail will rat. When everyone's like, who threw that rock? They all say like Popeye did it or like Mickey Mickey Mouse Mouse. did it. Mm -hmm. And then they have a couple of shots to get you, but nobody shows up to the courthouse. The guy who started the riot, he didn't start it, but the third baseman who was the focus of the riot, nobody will come back to testify. And because of that, he's allowed out. And when he gets out, he dedicates himself to helping. Yeah. I mean, he's still running the protection racket, but he says he won't deal drugs within the prison anymore. He says, even if I wasn't doing them, I felt like my promise to God included dealing. And he says, the miracles were happening everywhere. I made the decision to get clean and sober and people immediately started coming to me for help. Then he was offered the job as an inmate social catalyst. It was basically like AA in prison. And they were like, we're about to lose our accreditation if more people don't show up. So then he uses his protection status to like bully people into coming to AA. And he's like, I'll only do it if I can be the boss. And I'm like, there is no boss. No, that he's, he wants to be the president of AA. And they're like, there is no president, but you can be the chairman. And he calls himself the chairman of that group till the end of the book. Like he takes <laughs> that shit dead too. But so he gets all these people to go. And through it, he really finds the power and help of going to these meetings. And a couple other people get sober with him. And he finds that so rewarding. He says three of the eight people that he like strong armed into going to AA meetings stayed sober for a really long time. And then he has somebody tell him, Somebody with like no arm and no legs said, you should sing zippity doo every single day to start your day. And he was like, why would I do that? And the guy was like, do you know how grateful I would be to start every day with like a hop and a skip and a positive outlook? And he says, have a nice day. That is, of course, unless you've already gone ahead and made other plans. He goes, it cracks me up every time because it's so true. At night, my subconscious churned so much unrevolved mayhem and it couldn't wait to kick my ass in the morning. I'd wake up and my first thought would be, I'm fucked. Zippity doo dah, washed that away. It taught me that even in prison, I could be free. And then on August 23rd, 1969, one year after his sobriety date, he was released. So he gets out and he calls up that same friend again. Frank. Frank, who immediately gets him into a meeting. And I think at the beginning, Danny's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. But after going to that meeting, they all go to get coffee after. And he has this epiphany. I realized I needed the program of recovery. I conceded to my innermost self that without the meetings, my life was unmanageable and I needed to do what Johnny Harris had told me years early when he said, join us, Danny. I needed sobriety, not just to get out of the hole or look good for a parole board. I needed it for my life to make sense. And so now that he's back on the outside, he's 25 years old. He starts getting into his childhood. So immediately after getting out of jail, his sober house situation falls through. So he has to go home to his parents' house. He starts getting into what his childhood was like. It was very cold. Like I said, his dad was not affectionate. And also at some point in this book, we learned that the mom that he refers to as mom, his dad's wife, is not his biological mother. His dad had taken him from his biological mother when he was very young and basically just said, if you ever try to come take him, I'll kill you. Mm -hmm. His mother was married to a man who was at war, got pregnant, and then was completely cut out of Danny's life. Of course, Danny did not know that this is why she was not in his life until he was an adult. But he hadn't seen her since... He was three years old. So this other woman wife is the woman he refers to as mom. She and him have a very interesting relationship. And he understands looking back now, his father married his mother basically for a full-time nanny and caregiver. I don't think they went on to have other kids. He doesn't have any siblings. No. And he refers to it as indentured servitude. He says that he didn't let her have a car. He controlled her enormously. And she was literally there as his caretaker. And She loved him, but she was also quite manipulative and quite shut off emotionally. He never felt loved by either of his parents. He tells the story about his dad, who was always nice to other kids and cousins and the neighbors. And he says, I think part of why I disappointed my father so deeply was that he figured if he could get arrested once and then clean up his act for good, why couldn't I? He saw me as a failure and a disappointment. Ever since I was a kid, when my dad got drunk, I was the target of his anger. He tells the story about being at a barbecue And for some reason, he got mad at him and he locks him in the car on an 110 degree day. And Danny's just stuck in there until he almost passes out. And then finally, one person rescues him because none of his aunts and uncles will dare go to toe to toe with his father. So he's trapped in this car while everyone else is having a barbecue. That's like horrific. And finally, his uncle, who's only six years older than him, Gilbert, comes and lets him out and screams at his dad. He's the one person who won't let his dad push him around. So Gilbert is the more fatherly figure. But Gilbert is in and out of the system constantly. Gilbert's the one who gives 
Danny drugs for the first time. Yeah, Danny tries heroin at 12. <laughs> and is like, Gilbert is my mentor. He taught me everything good in this world. They grew up in like an abusive home. The grandparents were always beating them. And he looks over and he sees Gilbert nodding off one time. And he goes, that was a huge moment in my life. I realized Gilbert had a secret way to check out when things got hot. At that time, I didn't know it was heroin. I just knew that I wanted the same escape. And then he says, heroin could magically take away whatever was bothering me. Even if I didn't know it was bothering me, it felt like a warm blanket. And I thought, thank you, warm blanket. It protected me from my father's rage, my grandfather's rage, and then my own. But pretty soon the warm blanket started strangling me. He flash forwards to the present day. He's out of prison. He's starting to build a life. He's committed to being sober. And his buddy Frank, he has two Franks, Frank Carlisi and Frank Russo come to his rescue. They get him a job in an auto body repair shop. And he just continues down this path of saying, it makes me feel best and it gives me purpose to do good. And so he starts with little things. He tells a story about throwing away trash for this old woman across the street. And as he approaches her, she's cowering in fear. And he, he knows I might have robbed her. Who knows what I've stolen from her? She has every right to be afraid of me. But he's trying to make amends. And he does slowly win people over. So him and his friend Frank Russo, they get him a job working at an auto body shop. Slowly, they start working by cutting people's lawns. Also, people start tapping him to talk to other people going through shit. Frank starts bringing him to talk to kids they're trying to keep sober and just like various recovery programs. And he's getting very into recruiting people yeah. to sobriety. Frank and I stayed busy. We worked. We went to meetings, collected food for a food bank and carried socks and thermal underwear around in our trunks for homeless people we'd find on the streets. It felt good to be a helper and not a taker. He tells a story about they start a lawn mowing business and there's a woman on the end of the block whose house is in absolute disarray because one of her sons died at war. Another one of her sons got murdered by a robber. And then afterwards her husband committed suicide from grief. And so she just becomes a complete recluse. And so they just start taking care of her house and her lawn for free unasked. And because of that, a man across the street sees them and it goes, Hey, come over here. If you mow my lawn, I'll give you all of my tools and all of my equipment and stuff. And because of this, they're able to expand their business. It's just like a constant doing good helps him get good things. And he really believes in the karma of it. And I think the way he does this book, it would have been very easy to be like, this is just a book of him listing all the good things he's done for other people. But he's so transparent in being like, I believed that this was my pact with God, that if I did good, he would do good for me that it gave him a purpose. It gave him a reason to live. And it, it's just so inspiring the way that he's able to turn his life around by giving back. And he does a really good job of showcasing the times where he wavered. He's not like, oh, I got sober on August 23rd, 19, whatever. And every day since then, I've been able to like look drugs in the face and say, no, thanks, bitches. Gilbert will pop up time and time again with a balloon of heroin and say like, here's a job that I've got for us to do. Let's take some drugs and go rob shit. And he has to constantly look at his mentor, his uncle that he's looked up to his entire life and say like, no. Now I looked at my uncle, the guy who taught me how to piss like a man, brought me fishing, trained me to box, taught me everything I needed to know about drugs, guns, prison, and being a man. I'd always wanted Gilbert's attention. I wanted to spend time with Gilbert. I wanted to be Gilbert. The money and the drugs were sitting in front of me along with the promise of joining up with the uncle I adored but I knew what I had to do. I said no to him for the first time. I just can't. So after his lawn mowing company takes off, he, as Ashley said, was getting more and more involved with helping rehabs and helping bring people to meetings. And he actually ends up getting offered a part-time job working with the new group called Recovery and Freedom that was expanding. At Recovery and Freedom, he meets this woman named Debbie and they just fall in love very quickly. Debbie and I had only been dating a few months when her mom said, when are the two of you going to get married? As we know, this is now his second wife. He got married at 18 years old, I believe, and then divorced by 21 at some point when he was in jail. And he says that the problem is I didn't look at marriage as a lifelong commitment or a sacrament. I saw it as an opportunity for a good party, a way to make your old lady happy and something to do until I didn't feel like doing it anymore. Debbie was an angel, loving, happy, beautiful, full of life. Every day when she got home from work, she'd make a big show of giving me a picture she'd drawn for me. Cute, funny caricatures of the two of us. Like Debbie is incredible. Also the pictures of her, she's gorgeous. She came from this rich family who loved him because they had met in recovery. So they thought that he would help her stay sober and everything was set up for them. But he says, infidelity was the culture I grew up in and it went both ways. Growing up in a Mexican culture, I was taught women are like the Virgin Mary. They have children and are therefore miracle makers, but since they're objectified, they can be dismissed. I'm not proud of this, but for lack of any other example, I had embraced this way of thinking. All the men I knew growing up had one in the house and one in the street, and I would be no exception. There were women everywhere, at meetings, at works, and stores. And apparently for some women, my being married made me an even bigger magnet. I had options and I was open to all of them. Also around this time, he runs into Dennis again. So Dennis is the guy who flipped on him and that's what led to Danny's 
longest incarceration. And Dennis is hitchhiking by the side of the road. He looks like shit. So he's petrified, obviously, running into Danny. And he says, if Dennis hadn't caught me clean and sober with a car and a fiance high on life, I would have killed him. I would have to kill him just to save face in my community. Now the clean and sober Danny is able to be like, things are bad for Dennis. I'm just going to drive him to where he needs to go. And that's it. But it just shows how much he's worked towards forgiveness. And this whole book is a lifelong journey and learning how to channel your rage and understand how you're raised and work on yourself. He gets this mentor, Sam Hardy, who was also somebody who had been in and out of prison and somebody who had really worked on their sobriety. And he meets up with him per someone else's suggestion. And he says, he helps me redirect my perspective. He would stand on the beach with me and say, stop one of those waves, okay? The ocean's more powerful than you, buddy. He reminded me in a not so subtle ways that the planet was more than capable of surviving without my contributions. He'd say, the Chinese built the Great Wall, all 4,000 miles of it without your help. The ocean, the moon, turning the tides, an avalanche on a mountain. There are a lot of forces at play in the world that lie beyond the reach of your control. Sam's point was that I was but a small thing in a big world. And knowing that helped me put my own struggles in perspective. Sam said, Dan, don't take everything on your shoulders. The ocean, other people's behaviors, they do what they're going to do. Since you can't control that, don't be distressed by it. My other favorite Samism is the way I see it. If he ain't worth killing, he ain't worth fighting. And if he ain't worth fighting, then he ain't worth getting upset about. And since you're not upset, grab me a Dr. Pepper from the icebox. That's funny. Sam also gets him a job selling tools and he puts on his best suit and he's ready to be the best salesman. And he goes up and he knocks on the door and gives his best sales pitch. And everyone is like, go the fuck away. So then he's like, wait a second. Instead, he puts on regular clothes, puts all the tools in his trunk and is like, hey, you guys want some of these? And he starts selling tools like he stole them and he sells out. Next, he gets a full time job with a narcotics prevention project. And he says, it had always been a dream of mine to work in a field of treatment and recovery. I was already spending so much of my time doing what I could in meetings and reaching out to people. But to have a full time job trying to get people clean was a gift from God. At the NPP, I'd be doing God's work and getting paid to do it. So he gave his share of the lawn mowing company to Danny and made my life the full blast recovery work. I'd hit the streets and talk to dealers I knew. A lot of them had customers who were flat broke and hassling them for more dope even though they couldn't afford it. He was just thrilled. Yeah, but at the same time, he was a horrible husband to poor Debbie. He says, though I was helping a lot of people get clean, I was back for round two being the world's shittiest husband. The excuse I made to myself was that I was doing so much good for so many people, I could be selfish in my personal life. And he really feels now for how poorly he treated Debbie. But he reveals, when it came down to it, my bad behavior with women wasn't just about a male chauvinist culture. At its roots, it was connected to something darker and more insidious, a family secret that I had carried with me from when I was seven years old. So then he tells a story about how when he was seven years old, he was at the house with his mom when his uncle David came over. His mom throws him out of the house and is like, go play outside. They shut all the windows. They shut all the doors. He thinks they're preparing a gift for him, which is heartbreaking. He's like, Uncle David is here. He's inside of my mom. They've got a secret and it's going to be something really good for me. Later, he says to his dad, oh, Uncle David was here. Obviously, his dad is like, well, why was Uncle David here? And the mom goes into absolute denial mode. And she's like, I don't know why he's lying. He's not telling you the truth. Danny goes into his room. He can hear them arguing, screaming. His parents come in and he knows that there's no right way to answer this. And he can tell that if he tells the truth, his mom is going to get beat. And if he tells the truth, he'll get beat. And he says, I lied. He feels absolute betrayal from both sides. He's like, why is my dad so mad at me? And then also like, why is my mom letting this happen to me? Like why? He just doesn't understand the situation at all. About a year after this went down, my mom made me my favorite snack, fried okra, put it on the table and asked, why did you lie about Uncle David coming by? She looked into my eyes and repeated the question. I said, I don't know. I guess I'm just bad. I was taking the rap for something I knew I hadn't done and didn't understand. I didn't know what an affair was. I didn't know what my mother and my uncle were doing, but somehow my parents blamed me for it. She smiled. Eat, eat. She was mothering me and gaslighting me at the same time. My mother's affair with my uncle David continued for almost 30 years. A lot of people were broken by it. Two people died early because of it. My dad did for sure. And his sister, Uncle David's wife, my Aunt Lobby, my whole family was broken because of the affair. The mark it left on me was indelible. My feelings about women became so twisted. I never trusted any of them after that. I figured women were out to get you. So I had to get them before they got me. I wasn't violent. I was dismissive. If you were going to be my old lady, the other women were just something you had to get used to. And your feelings about them didn't rate. I was the only one allowed to have feelings in my house, just like my dad. If someone was going to lie, it was going to be me. If there was going to be cheating, I was going to be the one doing it. If someone was going to fuck someone over, I was going to do it first. Obviously, I'm not saying he's a good guy, but I, when we talk about like what makes a good memoir and we talk about retrospection, he goes, for me to blame all women for that scenario and even for me to blame my mother, who was living like an indentured servant under a tyrannical regime, didn't register at the time. It took me decades to figure this out, but at the time, I was in protect myself mode and any woman in my path was paying the price. He also, I will say, in writing this book, obviously he was not respectful to the women in his life 
throughout most of his life. But in writing this book, there is no gratuitous bullshittery. Do you know what I mean? Would you like to expand? Yes. I do think we read a lot of books from men who are like, I cheated on my wife. Here's every sexy detail. And I feel bad about it. I shouldn't have treated her that way. And it's like, okay, well then why did you like revel in the details like this? Or sure, I shouldn't have screamed at her, but she was being such a fucking bitch. Yeah. (laughs) He really doesn't blame any of the women in his life. Right. And so, but the final straw with Debbie is one day when she has a friend staying with them. Debbie goes to bed early. So Danny and Debbie's friend are just hanging out on the couch watching TV. They hook up. And then her friend gets sober and makes amends to Debbie and tells her what happened. And Debbie's like gone. He never sees her ever again. And so then he again goes back into the toxic masculinity of his childhood. And he says, we Trejos had to be very masculine in every way at every moment. And he tells the story about how in his elementary school, they were trying to do the hokey pokey and he refused to do it. And he got sent home from school. And when he told his dad what the hokey pokey was, his dad went back to the school and said, how dare you teach my son? to shake his hips like that. I don't send my son to school for you to teach him to shake his ass. He's a man. I never had to do the hokey pokey again. If I ever did anything around my dad or uncle that wasn't considered manly, I was called a sissy. It was as humiliating as it was intended to be. I was taught to hate anything they considered feminine. It was a lesson I learned too well. In 1975, he has a new wife named Joanne. (laughs) She lasts three years. They again get divorced because of his slandering. But in the meantime, he takes in his... So Gilbert has a son also named Gilbert. This is the second Gilbert in this book of three. There's more to come. So Gilbert, oldest Gilbert, is in jail again. His son Gilbert is living with Danny and his wife, Joanne. They are just taking in people off the street. I mean, his life is really filled with trying to help recovering addicts. He says, every day starting at 6 a.m., I was tracking people down on the street and in drug dens, convincing them to go into treatment, taking them to job interviews, dealing with their parole officers, going to meetings, sponsoring dudes in the program. I was busy and I loved it. In a way, the work tapped into something I felt when I fought fires back in juvie and even what I felt when I defended the underdogs in prison. Through drug counseling, I was helping people. I was making a difference. Of course, as I said, him and Joanne are divorced because of the flandering. Next, he meets Diana. (laughs) You guys will never believe it, but he marries her too. He meets Diana. Everyone he meets, he meets in rehab. I mean, he loves a good party. It seems like he loves to go dance. I mean, he's been sober for years, but he always talks about how he loves to just like find a place to go out dancing. So having a wedding is a really fun way for him to get his groove on. He would love bat mitzvahs. (laughs) Yes. Someone tell him about bat mitzvahs. Anyway, so everyone he meets also, he will only date sober women because he doesn't go to bars. Everyone he's meeting is at these meetings. The next he meets Diana. So also around this time, his mom has a mental breakdown and then starts seeing a counselor where she's talking through what you talk to a counselor about. And this counselor then plays the tapes from those sessions for Danny's father, which is definitely illegal. Yeah, he calls them in. And as a family, they have to listen to her detail her affair to her therapist that she had done confidentially after a breakdown. Then obviously the dad freaks the fuck out. He goes to David's house, puts a gun in his mouth. And after Aunt Lobby, so David's wife begs Danny's dad not to do anything. It does just shred the family though. So everything is in shambles after that. He kicks her out, but they end up back together. And it's just like a colder, more miserable way to live. It turns out he can't function without her. I mean, he says they were so fucked up together, but they were even more fucked up apart. So they got back together in a way I took it as another betrayal. So in 1981, Diana and I were having fun. We went to meetings. We traveled to recovery conventions together. We went to Palm Springs, Lake Tahoe. But it all falls apart. They break up. And a couple months later, it turns out Diana is pregnant. I didn't know what to do, but it was her choice. And she told me she was going to have the baby. I said I'd always take care of her and our child. I knew that much, but I couldn't think beyond it. I was almost 36 years old, plenty old enough to have a child, but I'd lived a long time without that kind of responsibility. And I was selfish. A little bit later, he says he was young and selfish. He says, yeah, like, at that point, he had been like 45. He was like 45 years old. He was just like, I was just a baby. <laughs> An old, big baby. <laughs> Not the youngest baby I've ever seen. <laughs> Definitely a stale baby. <laughs> Before his son is born, his father passes away. Danny talks about for the funeral arrangements. Nobody wanted his mom there because everybody was so angry at her about the affair. But Danny really went out of his way to make sure she was included, to make sure his friends took care of her and make sure that her friends were invited and allowed to be there. He kind of sent in his own friends as bodyguards and he felt like he had done this incredible thing for her and he was trying so hard to extend an olive branch. And then even in the coming years, as they grew apart, he would make these efforts to stay up with her 
And one day he was in her yard trimming her tree and she didn't like the way he trimmed her tree. And she screamed at him and said, get out. This is my house now. And he just never spoke to her. Yeah. Again. He was like, that's it. So then Diana is almost ready to deliver. She and Danny are out one night. A man runs up on them and Danny punches this guy in the face and the guy's tooth kind of cuts Danny's hand wide open. So he has to go to the hospital and get stitches. They stitch it up without cleaning it. So then this guy's disgusting mouth germs are in Danny's arm and it gets horribly infected. He almost loses his arm to the infection. And while he's in the hospital dealing with this, Diana has the baby and Danny boy is his son. Danny boy is born. He's very happy to have a baby. He says, I was a father and I couldn't have been happier. The second I held Danny boy for the first time, I felt like a dad. I knew I had the responsibility of a lifetime in front of me. I had a reason to live, someone whose life would truly depend on me. This is fucked up to admit, but since Diana and I weren't together, I felt like the moment would have been even more beautiful if Diana wasn't in the room with us. I know that sounds horrible, but I instinctively knew that child and I had our own journey ahead, just the two of us. I cannot believe he did not marry Diana. Yeah. They were never married. They broke up. Shortly after Danny Boy was born, Diana was an attentive mother and had kept a good house. She was still living in an apartment on Gardner. She loved changing diapers and being a mom. She had full-time custody, more or less, and he would just come and visit all the time. But he was not fully involved. He had his own life, and he kind of came and went as he pleased. Yeah, so I also want to say around this time, he is even more involved in recovery. He's opening up a bunch of sober houses and methadone clinics all over Los Angeles. Which were, like, very progressive things at the time. I very believe. progressive. So he goes to pick up Danny one day, and he finds drug paraphernalia in Diana's house. And he flips out. He takes Danny. I went to the apartment and grabbed Danny boy. Diana was crying. I said, if you ever go near this child again, I'll kill you. In that moment, I meant it, but it didn't dawn on me that that was the exact same thing my father had said to my birth mother when he took me from her. A little bit of therapy in there. It's there something, a little bit of self-reflection. Yeah. He also does let her near the child again. It's not the same thing with his dad where he literally didn't meet his birth mom for decades, <laughs> but he is like, I'm not leaving my kid alone here when she's using. So he just takes Danny boy and he's driving into the night. He doesn't know where to go. He says he's just driving around to different places where he knows that his sober friends hang out to try and find any woman who can come to his house and help him. And it's like 2 a.m. He's like going to like gas stations and looking for like sex workers at work. Yeah. <laughs> to be like, who can, I just need any woman to take this baby from me. It's like, sir, raise your child. I mean, he keeps being like, well, I had work in the morning. And it's like, well, Okay, call in sick. This is not a chore. This is your son. So then he ends up getting a hold of the woman who lives above Diana, who they call Nanny, who was nannying Danny boy. And Nanny is able to help them out. And they kind of end up with this arrangement where Nanny fully takes care of Danny boy Monday through Friday. And then Danny comes to pick up and keep his kid on the weekend. He's just co-parenting with this woman. Yeah, they're like, well, her son was grown and she didn't have much else to do. So he fully supports both of them. She's essentially his new ex-wife. Yeah. <laughs> and then he has this other former addict that's in recovery. That's his friend who's coming and staying with him. And it's like these two men are raising the baby on the weekends. And then this random neighbor raises the baby on the week. And that's how they figure it out. <laughs> yeah. He says later that like when he needed babysitters, he would just pick people at Venice Beach. And so he talks about how his son learned to break dance because sometimes he just needed a couple hours. And so he'd leave his son with the break dancers. Or there was this guy who walked around with like a lizard in his pocket and rollerblades. And sometimes that guy was watching Danny. He's like, I knew them all. They were good for it. <laughs> so not only was Diana using, but she does end up in prison for drug offenses. And so that's why this situation went on for as long as it did. I think she was in there for years. Yeah. So for the next several years, they have Nanny on weekdays and Danny and George on weekends. Then one day at a meeting, Danny meets someone who is doing extra work. He'd never heard of this, but this kid mentions he's been an extra in film and television. He has an agent who specializes in hard looking types like us, and he gets paid $50 a day to be in the background of film shoots. And the idea was interesting to him. He talks to his business partner. He does the methadone clinics with, and they're like, yeah, sounds fun. They're like, go do it. It'll help bring awareness to our cause. And when he's on these sets, he's passing out his number to whoever will take it. I do think if I needed it, Danny Trejo would let me call him today. Yeah. He does seem like he's super available to anybody who's struggling in the sober community. So he's passing out his card all the time. And one time, it's late at night, he gets a call from some kid on a set who calls him and says, there's cocaine everywhere on this production. I don't know if I can hold He doesn't out. even say it's a production. He's like, there's cocaine everywhere at work. It wasn't until Danny showed up that he realized, he's like, oh, a film set. Okay. And he's just walking around looking for this kid. 
and he runs into an old friend, Eddie Bunker. So Eddie Bunker wrote Straight Time based on his own book, No Beast So Fierce, which starred Dustin Hoffman. I don't know it, but it felt like something you guys might know. So I'm going to leave it in. (laughs) (laughs) It seems important. I mean, I'm not going to get into all the details of Eddie Bunker's life because this isn't Eddie Bunker's episode. He could write a book if he wants. I hope he does. I hope he did. Maybe he did. But if you're interested in this book, Eddie Bunker is another interesting person who has his whole life written. He was like the smartest guy in jail. He wrote everybody's legalese from the inside. And so when he got out, he was able to write scripts and he became a hugely successful Screenplay writer and then consultant for mobster and heist movies, which is a very cool job. Very cool job. I love a mobster and a heist movie. So he runs into this guy, Eddie Bunker, and they're like, what's up? I haven't seen you since you were a heavyweight bo- or lightweight boxer in jail. And they reminisce about old times. And he's like, you know, I'm working on this film and we need a trainer for our main well, actor. First, Eddie Bunker, it wasn't even about work yet. First, Eddie Bunker was like, I am actually fucked right now. And I'm freaking out because I am on methadone right now keeping me off heroin and I don't have enough in LA to get me through this trip. And Danny's like, would you believe I run methadone clinics? And the guy literally doesn't. He's like, that's a mean thing to say to me right now. I'm not in a good way. Yeah. And so then now that that's off the table and he's like really done Eddie a solid, Eddie is like, all right, so on this film, we definitely need extras. We might need someone to help out with this boxing scene. That's like about a boxing scene in a jail because you were a boxer in a jail Could you help out a little bit, kind of consult on the project? And then he ends up being the boxer opposite Eric Roberts, famously the father of Emma Roberts. And from that, his career takes off. He's getting paid great money. He's making like $350 a day. He can't believe it. He's so great at his job and everybody loves him so much, I think, that he just keeps going from gig to gig to gig and everyone takes him with him next. And he always has such a good attitude because of where he's been that the things that actors and extras and he says one time he's an extra in a movie and they're sitting at like near the craft services table and someone's complaining about the quality of the craft services meal. And he's like, I don't know, man, I have never been to a job that feeds me three square meals a day before. This is pretty cool. I met Maeve while we were shooting Penitentiary 3. I will say nothing is funnier than the list of Danny Trejo movies. It's always like Penitentiary 3, Revelations 8, Bad Boys 12, Dark Days Night. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like acting was just an incredible way for him to escape, almost like escaping into a fun game of June's journey. It's the best way to sit back, relax, and let your inner Sherlock escape into the glamorous, roaring 20s. You search for hidden clues, solve mystery after mystery, and there are thousands of vivid stories. You can join the detective club and play against or with other players. You'll even get the chance to play in a detective league, putting your skills to the ultimate test. You can even let your imagination run wild and decorate your island to your own taste. There are so many things you can do in June's journey. There are new levels and new games added all the time. You play as June Parker, an amateur detective distantly related to Claire on a quest to solve the murder of her sister and uncover her family's many secrets. My favorite time to play June's journey is honestly just on the subway. You sit there, you look around, there's not much to see. Why not a game of June's journey to pass the time? There's a detective in all of us. Find your inner detective and download June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Speaking of stories, if you're feeling a little anxious or overwhelmed, it can make it hard to shift into gears and get in the mood. But with Dipsy, you can focus on what makes you feel in the groove. Dipsy is an app with hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, no matter who you're into or what turns you on. Find stories about that intriguing coworker with a sexy accent, maybe your fitness instructor. That's a, that's a sexy situation. I'd like to hear more about that. There's new content released every week. So in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. There are also sleep stories, wellness sessions, and written stories. I feel like it might be kind of fun to listen to Dipsy with someone else, but it's also just like a incredible, incredible on your own situation. Really close your eyes, get lost in the story and let loose, baby. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30 day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash worm. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipsystories.com slash worm, dipsystories.com slash worm. So speaking of sexy stories, he has a very unsexy pickup line for Maeve. 
he says that he wants to take care of her for the rest of his life. And he like looking back on that moment is like, that's what I hated about my parents' relationship. That's awful. Like, I can't believe I said that. Anyway, they do still get married. No, they don't. They actually never get married. With Maeve, he never gets married? No, I was looking at his Wikipedia today. It's funny that he marries every single person except for the mother of his children. That's where he draws the line. He's like, marriage is just a joke. A baby is serious. So he meets Maeve. They move in together. And she says, I'm not going to move in with you unless we go get Danny Boy, who at this point was living with Nanny, mostly. Then Nanny dies. And so he's like, that was easy. I called Maeve and I said, Danny Boy lives with me. (laughs) Then Gilbert comes back one more time. Danny has to be like, I just want you to get clean. Like, please go try and get clean. Gilbert drives away into the night and overdoses shortly after that and passes away. That was a major loss for him. He says, when I got home from the funeral, I wept like a baby. I felt truly lost. Half of me was gone. Whether Gilbert was in prison or not, we were never out of touch. He was the defining relationship of my life. And now I was alone, left to carry on without him. Professionally, he continues on to make these movies. He's getting more and more roles and the roles are getting better. He's getting speaking lines. He's getting names. He's also getting like flown out. So he's not just an extra. He's not just on set to be the local hard looking guy. He's getting jobs and they're flying him out first class. Him and Maeve live in an apartment with his son in Venice Beach. They get to live there for free because he helps out by collecting rent for the landlord. People ask me if I mind doing B movies and the answer is every time I do a movie and my involvement helps it get made, that means people are getting paychecks that assist their families in putting food on the table. Plus movies are what they are. The people you meet, the conversations you have, the life that goes down while you're making them, that is the gold. And then also in terms of the rent situation, him helping out the landlord, he has this situation in his life that's very back and forth where he never really knows if people want him there because he's kind of the muscle and people are intimidated by him and he's the protection. Do they like him? Do they need him there? Or do they just need someone to come in swinging potentially? And I feel like this is just one situation, but that happens constantly throughout his life where he doesn't ever really know if he's around because he's the guy for the job or if he's around because they're like, well, we double down. We get a guy who can keep everybody in line and we get a guy who can do the job. He doesn't want to just be seen as the tough guy. He wants to be respected as an actor and a person. Maeve moves in. They end up having two babies in two years. Gilbert, their first son, and then Danielle, their daughter. So if you guys are wondering, that's Danny, Danny boy, Danielle. He's got his uncle Gilbert, his cousin Gilbert, and now his son Gilbert. And all of his friends are named Frankie. Yeah. And he's about to marry his second Debbie. (laughs) Spoiler. In 1991, two Chicano scripts rolled through Hollywood that both centered on the formation and growth of La M.A., the biggest Mexican gang in the California prison system. Since I was a high profile Chicano who had done time, both movies reached out to me. They knew my involvement would give them credibility. One was called American Me, directed by and starring Edward James Almos, and the other was Blood In, Blood Out. This then begins a very interesting story of cultural appropriation and fictional editorializing and liberties. He reads the script for American Me, which was a very buzzy film about the Mexican mafia. And he is like, these are all real people. It's all based on actual families, actual people who are very high up in that group. It uses their real names. It uses the real name of the gang. And it pretends to tell their story as it happened. Having been in the system, Danny literally knows some of the people in the script. And he goes and he's like, this is just not what happened. And he sits down with Edward James almost, who he also is very put off because he shows up to the meeting dressed professionally for a meeting. And Edward, Edward James, I don't know what he goes by. Yeah, he dresses up like he's in La M.A. He's like in full blue. And so he's like, well, that was not great. Maybe he's method methoding for the movie. He's really turned off and he goes, when you take the dress and the coat of the cholo or a crip or a blood or a Mexican mafia member or an Aryan brother for that matter, you become something that is no longer Mexican or black or white. When it comes to gang wear, how you are dressed is not merely a costume. It's a declaration that you are committed to a life of crime for which you're willing to sacrifice well-being of those around you. Moms, dads, wives, sisters, brothers, children. To me, real Mexicans, whites and blacks were the kind of men who worked hard and took their kids to little league practice. Perhaps I was overreacting. After all, I was already interested in taking the part of Geronimo in Blood In, Blood Out. But he, he could tell, he's like, this isn't respectful and this isn't somebody who's going to come in and understand what he's saying. He's talking to him and he isn't just saying like, hey, this is fucked up. First of all, he asked, did you talk to the current head of La MA? Which weirdly enough is an Irish Croatian guy. Yeah. He just grew up with a lot of Mexicans. And so he just like learned Spanish and took over in prison. But his name is, I was, because I remember being like, that's a white sounding name. 
as Joe Morgan. So he like sits down and he's not like, oh, I hate this fuck off. He just says, he has his questions. He's like, did you talk to the guy who's the head of this group? Yes or no. And then Edward James almost is like, yes, he's on board. Second of all, he's like, these are the actual deviations in the storyline that upset me. And Edward James almost is like, it's more theatrical this way. And Danny Trejo says specifically, the people you're talking about are not theatrical people. And Edward James almost takes literally zero of them into consideration. And most importantly, Danny goes, I can tell right away that he's lying, that he got Joe's permission. Everything that's happening on the outside, Joe knows about. So it's only a matter of time before I hear what Joe has to think or that it'll get out or that he'll make his wishes known. And then the third thing is that Edward James almost says that anyone who's going to do blood in, blood out cannot have a role in American Me. You can't be in both movies. Danny Trejo is like, I don't know. In Hollywood, there aren't that many roles for us. And so to say like there are these two major films coming front and center, hugely buzzy movies, and you're saying you have to pick one or the other, that's also fucked up. Then obviously the head of the gang calls Danny and is like, what do you think about this movie? And Danny's like, it sucks. Danny goes, Mm -hmm. I told him there might be some problems. He said he spoke to you. Joe goes, he didn't speak to me. And Joe goes, well, what are you thinking about doing? He goes, I'm going to do Blood In, Blood Out. And Joe goes, oh, the cute one. (laughs) Danny's like, I don't know that it's cute, but sure. And then Danny goes, well, what's going to happen to the actors and the crew? And he goes, those are people just making a paycheck. All in, eight, maybe 10 people died who ended up working on American Me. And it's people who claimed that they had spoken to Joe, people who claimed that they had been given permission. And a lot of people who had sworn allegiances to Joe and then went in to tell this story. And Danny really makes it known that he's like, this man who came in and thought it was a joke, he was warned by a lot of people that what he was doing would have repercussions and people died because of it. Yeah, he says almost as like a kid playing with a grenade thinking the whole time it was a sparkler. He also says that aside from the eight to 10 people who died directly because of this film, because they used the real name of the gang, because they gave notoriety to a gang that was pretty much, it was like an if you know, you know situation. And instead they were like, no, now it's an international film. And it like made kids want to join the gang. Overall, he's like the amount of people that potentially lost their lives because of this movie, you can't put a number on it. Meanwhile, Blood In, Blood Out, it was a similar story, but it was about a fictional gang. They were very respectful. So he gets into the process of making Blood In, Blood Out and they shot at San Quentin and the block that they had reserved to shoot on was his cell block. And so that was like a very full circle moment. He said at one point when they were walking to his cell block, they walked up the staircase where that man had tried to take Danny out and instead Danny's friend had took him out. The thing I'm most proud of is when we finished shooting Blood In, Blood Out, my fellow actors regarded me as a peer and not a convict. We were the actors and not the killers we portrayed. I'd gotten over my earlier insecurities and in turn gained a deep level of respect for the artists who had put so much time and care into crafting their characters. Meanwhile, he's still working on his internalized sexism and machismo. He has a conversation with Maeve about how he really struggles with his emotions and being back there kind of awoke in him a lot of what he was feeling. And she says, Danny, I think you're suffering from PTSD. You've been traumatized by the knives and the guns and the violence by being in prison so long. All of the stories of men you've hit on the streets and boxing rings through steel grating. Average people haven't been through that. Average people haven't robbed a liquor store at gunpoint. Your experiences aren't normal. You've been through a lot. What she said was true, but I could only think of the people on the other side of those scenarios. I've put people through a lot. Yes, you have. But guilt without self-awareness makes it worse. So then he goes back through kind of his childhood history of robbing. The first time he ever robbed anybody, he was 15 at gunpoint. And he just talks about all the shame he feels. I never really given much thought to the insane masculinity I'd grown up in and how that had shaped me. I just figured if I stayed sober and helped other people get sober, I was doing everything I needed to. I didn't look at the little boy who was me and what happened to him and how all of that stuff informed how I became a man. I just thought I was another dude with really bad nightmares. Every stage of his life, there's another layer for him. So then he talks about how when Diana got out of prison... He had been allowing Danny Boy to go up and visit his parents who lived in a nice suburb about an hour north of L.A. And when she got out, he realized the right thing to do was to let him go live there full time because Venice obviously was a more dangerous place. There's more drugs. And they were just like, if we let him live in the suburbs with good schools and his mother, he has a better chance at this life. So they let him go and they stay with the two children in Venice. I will say here, I think they should have left Venice, too. Blood in, blood out made him a recognizable face. It made him a legitimate actor like people were recognizing him in the streets. His career was taking off. And he is saying that they couldn't leave Venice because of the free rent. Yeah, I mean, I'm very interested in the money of all this. So they're dating. He now has a better agent. He gets shows like Baywatch. He gets Con Air. I mean, that's huge. He's always playing these hard dudes. And he does say it gets to him. Con Air ended up being a good flick, but sometimes playing sick dudes like Johnny 23 gets to me. I've seen too many of them in real life. He does Heat, which put him in with like the big 
guys. He did it with Robert De Niro and all these other huge names. The movies just keep coming back and back. He's doing all these huge movies. He's getting flown all over the world. However, at home, him and Maeve are going through some bad things. Maeve keeps leaving. They're fighting. They're kicking each other out. It's hectic as hell. They lose their place in Venice in 1996. I mean, at this point, that means he has been in a movie with Robert De Niro where they're co-starring and he's still getting free rent and acting as the apartment complex supervisor. I do feel like they could have left Venice. <laughs> but he's trying his best to be a good father. I do think looking at how hard he was working, I bet he wasn't there a lot, but I didn't have specific goals or ambitions for my kids, except that more than anything, I wanted them to feel loved. My dad got along great with my cousins and the other kids in the neighborhood, but not me. He acted like there was something wrong with me and he couldn't give me attention or show me affection. He never told me he loved me. I told my kids that I loved them in private and in front of people. Danielle would kiss me. I'd kiss the boys. The boys hated it, but I did it anyway. He taught their t-ball team. And he says they were horrible. Every kid was the last pick, but he would say, what's the only failure in life? And they'd all answer, not trying, Mr. Trejo. Being this father to his kids, it makes him again, like look back and he says, the way I grew up, there was a certain toughness I had to have to survive. I was tough at the drop of a hat. In the joint, even in Jufi, I lost my ability to argue or get angry. I would go straight to rage. The best defense you can have at your disposal is that rage because with it, you can kill someone if necessary. When I got out of prison and was taking clients to court, I was amazed to see attorneys arguing. I kept waiting for one of them to hit the other. Where I come from, the bottom line to every argument was murder. I wanted my kids to be able to defend themselves, but I wanted them to see fighting as a last resort. He and Maeve officially break up. Their breakup was not smooth. He says that by late April of 1997, we were done and I was indeed free, but it wasn't for long. I showed up less than a month later, shirtless to pick up the children with another woman's name tattooed on my chest just to make her jealous. I was 53, acting like I was 17. A few months after that, Maeve married someone else to get back at me, so I married someone to get back at her. Oof, <laughs> sucks to be those husbands and wives. Well, his next wife gets the last laugh, so don't worry. He marries his second Debbie in 1997. She was very successful, which she liked. She had a ton of money. She drove her own Mercedes and owned a ton of properties. He moved into her giant house. And somehow he gets into a deal where she controls the finances in their family. She's constantly buying properties. They have eight rental properties, I believe. And he has no idea where the money is, where it's coming from, where it's go. I mean, he knows where it's coming from. He's working quite hard, but he doesn't know where any of it's going. He also, I mean, his kids are getting older and he says, maybe I was too easy on all my kids and the line between love and enabling became deeply obscured. So all of his kids at this point have tried drugs. Danny boy smokes weed and that's it. And so he's like, well, I don't know what's so bad about that. But Gilbert and Danielle start slipping into harder drugs. Unlike me, Gilbert and Danielle weren't fueled by rage. I got a thrill of scaring people and Danielle and Gilbert didn't. I'd raise them with the kind of love I'd never been given and I'd hope that would break the cycle. But here we were. Whatever the reasons, whether genetic, a chaotic home life, or a combination of the two, they took to it. Gilbert, who'd always been good at arguing, started using his skills to manipulate, triangulate, and gaslight in order to get high. At the same time, there's this other issue, and that's that he is sick with hepatitis C. He had just wrapped Reindeer Games in 1999, and he was about to start Spy Kids. His biggest concern about having hepatitis C was anyone finding out. So he says almost as bad as having hepatitis C, the treatment for it just made him so sick. It was awful, but he says... My biggest fears were whether I could still work and if I could keep people in Hollywood from finding out about my illness. I was sure they'd express concern and send well wishes, but there's something that happens in Hollywood when you get labeled damaged goods. He's taking this medication that makes him so sick. He's losing weight. He's feeling horrible, but he will not stop working. He goes straight from Spy Kids to Bubble Boy. And then he goes back to Spy Kids too. September 2002, he's invited to the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., and he finds out that he has been cured of hepatitis C, so he overcomes it. Things are going worse and worse for his son, Gilbert. Gilbert ends up having to go to a rehab in Utah. I mean, it's taking a toll on his life. He's feeling very out of control. Debbie, second Debbie, and him get a divorce, and somehow everything had been in her name, including his own cars. Like, she had made him sell all his cars and rebuy cars in her name. So when they get a divorce, she has everything and he's left with $30,000 in the bank and he moves in with his friend. Well, first he tries to move in with his son. He moves in with Danny boy and then he moves in with Danielle. And then finally he moves in with his friends back in his hometown in Pacoima, which is like just around the corner from his mom. And that's when he starts rebuilding his relationship with his mom. So he's kind of at this bizarre rock bottom where he's coming off of these major films. He's an international star. He somehow has no money. I do think he just didn't care. Like, I do think he, if he had yeah. fought Debbie for it. At one point when he has 30K, he goes to the bank, takes half of it out in cash and just hands it out on Skid Row. I agree with you that the money does not matter to him, but it is bizarre that somehow in his 60s with Spy Kids money, he could be crashing on his friend's crash pad. Yeah, it is crazy that after co-owning eight properties with Debbie, he didn't have one. <laughs> 
where he moves in with his friends, Mario and Max, they actually live a few blocks from where his mom lived in their, the house he grew up in. And he ends up finding forgiveness. And he says, the magic of forgiveness is so profound. And it starts with us forgiving ourselves. There were so many things in my life that I'd done because in the moment I felt that it was the only way to survive. I thought about the Lord's Prayer, which I've said every day since Soledad. When it came to my mom, it really hit home, especially the part where we ask God to forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I realized I couldn't ask God to take that heat off me and love me and absolve me if I didn't allow that for everyone else as well, especially my mom. Then they get started on the movie Machete. So the character of Machete, Robert Rodriguez had come up with it ages and ages beforehand. They started seeding it in slowly. So first he was making Spy Kids and he's like, what if we introduce this character Machete that we came up with, this Mexican-American superhero as the uncle in this movie. And then they start throwing it in in Grindhouse. And then finally it's able to be its own movie, which is really just an incredible moment. And he brings Gilbert and Danielle with him to shoot the movie. They're both starting to do better. They're both staying clean and they're all having a great time shooting Machete. Robert De Niro is number two on the call sheet. And I, that's a big moment for Danny to be like, I can't believe I'm number one over Robert De Niro. He gets back from Texas after shooting Machete. Danielle and Gilbert both slip back into drugs. And he is diagnosed with cancer. Again, he will not stop shooting, though. He is doing chemo, like, in between movies. Like, on the weekends and stuff. They are putting him under and injecting chemo into his tumor. They say that he has a year, potentially 14 months to live. And he's just like, no. Yeah, he signs on for Sons of Anarchy. (laughs) Yeah, he's He's, like, I'm not going to do that. He lists all the TV shows he's doing. It's like 15 things that year. Eventually, they say... We don't know how, but it seems your tumor is dead. So he just keeps working. He does machete too. I felt like I was fighting a war on three fronts. There was me who had to show up to work every day and smile and take pictures. Me who went to chemo treatments at the hospital and in my private moments prayed for strength. And then there was me who needed to be there for my children, knowing I was powerless over their addiction, but could do the only thing I knew to be right. Give love. He talks about coming to terms with himself as potentially an enabler. And someone who just cannot help his children. At one point, he's helping his daughter not get in trouble at the rehab, even though she was breaking out. And when she comes clean at the rehab, he's like, I told you to never admit you were guilty. And she's like, dad, I'm taking accountability. And you're telling me that's the wrong thing to do. I cannot have you around me while I get sober. And he says, after that, I was banned from her rehab. In between gigs, I was still working for Western Pacific, petitioning politicians, speaking at big conferences with 5,000 attendees and small rehab meetings with 12 teenagers. But in spite of all my years working in recovery, bringing countless people to rehabs, I was banned from Danielle's rehab. When it came to my own kids, everything I knew about recovery went out the window. And I know the fact that I was so high profile in recovery made it harder for my kids to get sober. People look at them like it should be easy. It's never easy. So he's on top of the world in some ways. You know, he's doing Machete Kills, which is the Machete 2 sequel. He's doing Badass and Badass 2 Badasses. He's doing all these movies with the funniest titles I've ever heard in my life. So Danielle gets clean, but Gilbert is in a bad way also. And then his mom dies and he's on set doing... Muppets Most Wanted with Ray Liotta and Craig Balcom. And he says he finds out early in the morning and he's, of course, heartbroken, but he won't cry about it. He's acting very stoic and he gets on set and they're about to call action. And right as they're about to start the scene, the actor that portrays Kermit the Frog per Muppet instructions is not allowed to ever break character. So the actor has Kermit the Muppet turn to Danny Trejo and right up in his face go, I'm sorry, your mom died. (laughs) And Danny breaks and starts hysterically crying and has to run off the stage and Ray Liotta has to come and comfort him and like help him gain his composure and stuff. And he goes, I think my mom sent Kermit to me that day to make me cry because she wanted to see me be sad about it. And I was like, God, it is crazy to hear that Kermit made you break. (laughs) Also, there's something insane as an adult man. I understand that that's the rules of the road or whatever, but at some point, when are you human and not Muppet? I do feel like there is something deeply emotional about Kermit. Yeah. Even when things could not possibly be more overwhelming, Freshly is there to help you skip the meal prep stress. Freshly's new lineup of effortless in-season meals gives you more time to enjoy every single moment. With Freshly, you're not stuck with fast food chains or frozen dinners when you want a quick and healthy meal. They provide delicious, effortless, balanced meals without you having to sacrifice your time, without you having to stress over meal prep, over any of the logistics cooking time. Nobody likes to wait for an oven to preheat. The meals are nutrient packed, designed by professional nutritionists and crafted by professional chefs. So the classic meals like steak, peppercorn, 
Masterful mac and cheese sides and a new line of plant-based meals are going to give you the healthiest, most balanced meal that you can possibly make in three minutes. Skip the grocery shopping, skip dirty dishes. Your meals arrive cooked and fresh every single week. My favorite meal is probably some of the burgers. I think the mac and cheese was delish. Make your summer dinners stress-free with Freshly. Right now, you can get $125 off your first five orders at Freshly.com slash worm. That's $125 off at Freshly.com slash worm. He talks about meeting Obama and talking to his son on the phone. He says, that was a roller coaster in my life. Sobriety had taken me to a place where the president of the United States knew who I was, and my son was making crack in baby food jars. So then at one point, he does meet up with Gilbert. Gilbert asks for $100 and he gives it to him. And Danielle is upset about it. She's like, why did you give him money? And it turns out to be the last run that he goes on. He's found a couple days later in a drug den. They end up being able to get him to detox and things are going well for him. Like he ends up being able to stay sober this time. As far as we know, he goes with Danny on like a couple of work trips. They end up spending a lot more time together. Danny, however, has this incident where he falls and hits his head and he breaks his jaw and he still does movies. So he goes and he's filming some movie in Rome and they're like, is this a choice you're making to speak out the side of your mouth? And he's like, yeah, this is how gangsters talk in America. And they're like, we love that about you. (laughs) Maeve, however, is a nurse and she's listening to his symptoms and she's like, you had a stroke. I'm sure of it. He goes back to the hospital. Maeve demands they take an MRI. Turns out, sure enough, he had two major strokes and he was bleeding on both sides of his brain. They go into emergency surgery. When he comes out, Somehow they decide to do Trejo's tacos and donuts. So then he starts the next venture where he's making donuts and tacos. He moves in with some of his best friends from childhood, from sobriety. They have this home where the four of them live and they all take care of each other and he's able to support everybody and they all have their roles and he's just very grateful and happy. He gets asked to do a Super Bowl commercial and he's like, oh yeah, that'll be cool. And they say, Danny, we didn't hire you because you're tough. We hired you because you're loved. And that was a huge moment for him because all he's ever wanted, that's why he loved playing Uncle Machete and things like that, where it's like, yeah, he's a tough guy. Yeah, he's hard and he doesn't take shit, but he's not just a criminal. Like to have him around all the time as just the scary guy was, it really got to him. The rest of 2015 was insanely busy. I was working all over the place. In the 10 years, starting with 2010, I did almost 300 movies and TV shows. So the names and faces melt into each other. I mean, come on. I did a movie called Three-Headed Shark Attack. I did everything that came my way. Sometimes a job in the morning and another job the same night. Most actors are scared of what their next project is going to be, but that's never been a problem for me. I take the Michael Caine approach. It's all work and all work is honorable. I've done jobs on huge projects. The four Spy Kids movies, Grindhouse, Machete, Machete Kills, Heat, Con Air, he goes, a lot of things went straight to movies, voices and cartoons and television. At the end of the day, a bad day on a movie set will always be a million times better than your best day in prison. Then Gilbert, the second Gilbert, so Uncle Gilbert's son gets out of prison. He's been in jail for 38 years, I believe. Mm-hmm. For a murder charge at 17, where he was tried as an adult and got life. Yeah. And then from there, because I think life sentence is shorter than 38 years, but just other altercations, other his sentence just kept getting extended and extended. And so he and Danny work together to pass a new law that makes it guarantees that anybody who is tried as a child or under 18 gets their chance at parole. Okay. Because a lot of these people just weren't getting to go to court and have their day in court to have their parole heard. And so that's what he had originally reached out to Danny for is he had been promised parole as early as 15 years ago. He never got his shot. And they passed this law in his name. And since then, 3,500 people have been released who were sentenced to life as children. Yeah, Gilbert was 55 years old when he was released from Ironwood State Prison after 38 years. He now works helping in Scared Straight programs. Then Gilbert and Danny make a movie. Gilbert three. Danny's son, Gilbert, and Danny make a movie together. Gilbert writes a film about addiction. Now that Gilbert is sober, he writes a movie. He's directing it. Danny is in it. He says, from a son was the first time I really cried on a job. He also has a fight with his son where his son says, you're the way you are because of toxic masculinity. And he calls up his friend Donald and he goes, Donald, what the hell is toxic masculinity? Because it's what Gilbert says I was raised in. Donald said there's a kind of misguided masculinity that poisons men and fucks up their relationships. He said it was beautiful. I could still gain inside of my life and be set free from the bonds and patterns. It was true. I was 74 and I was finally understanding the engine driving so much of my behavior. It was a hard V8 from the hood. As much as I hated the way my father and uncles were, their machismo, their Chicanoism, I was a charo just like them, unfaithful to my wives, violent towards other men, angry, guilty of playing the big shot, 
I knew I'd made great strides in other areas. I was clean and sober. I'd helped people in so many ways as I could think of. I was a loving dad who was not afraid to show my children affection. But somewhere down in my core, I still carried a deep fear about being vulnerable and weak and being fucked over that immediately manifested itself in anger and control. So I guess he worked on it. Yeah, it seems like he really has been just doing a little bit at a time, chipping away. He also started like a music record for Mexican ballads. He also got his own day on January 31st. It's Danny Trejo Day in Los Angeles. He's also the voice in LAX that tells you welcome to Los Angeles. He loves LA. Uh, And then it just kind of closes out. He's happy with his life now. He says, this is actually something I find really beautiful, especially because I had such a volatile relationship. He says Mavis is best friend now. After they were able to sort through all their shit, now that their relationship is no longer romantic, he says they talk almost every single day. They're so close. He says that she's still the love of his life, but in, it seems like a much more platonic way. I pray. I pray all the time, anytime, out loud, because why not? He does the whole thing about everything he's grateful for. He said, I asked God one last question. I say, God, how am I doing? God replies, great, Danny, you're almost out of hell. Keep it up. I smile to myself and thank him for my life. Anyway, Ashley, final thoughts? My final thoughts are that I think this was a really beautiful book. I think it was, first of all, deeply interesting. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I think that it's very rare. I think that we see someone truly come to terms with horrific actions. And he does seem like, You know, he was a product of certain circumstances and he fought out of it. Very like Drew Barrymore, but with crime (laughs) instead of child acting. Yeah, I love this book. I mean, he does everything we want from somebody, which is awareness, work, change. The idea that at 74, he's still looking inward and trying to work on himself and go back and find forgiveness and work on himself. Also no finality in it. There was no like, and here's how I changed. And now I'm officially better. It was always like, and here's what I'm working on. The stories were interesting. Every detail was interesting. The compassion that was given to everybody he met. It was so interesting. That's why I think this book is so different than a Rob Lowe and Anthony Kiedis. People's stories weren't told for this titillating, exploitative, like here's another crazy story. Can you believe this guy ended up dead in a tree? Everything was about, here's how somebody becomes them. Here's what they were good at. Here's what their faults were. Here's where we're all just doing the best we can. He has like a lot of compassion for people and a lot of forgiveness. And it is such a deeply inspiring story about always figuring out a way to make yourself better and give back. And I do think this is a story that could change somebody's life, could make somebody feel less alone and seen. It really, he says that all his whole life, everybody's like, well, if you could get sober, anybody can. And he's like, yeah. That's what they all say. And that's why I'm good at what I do, because if I can do it, then anyone can. Thanks, Danny. You guys, I love you so much. We'll see you on the Patreon. We'll see you on the Facebook wormhole. We'll see you in the world. We'll see you. I'll see you when I see you. Love you guys. I'll see you when I see you. And I want to thank our five star reviewers this week. The Ken 84. You are the Ken to this podcast, Barbie. Thank you. Fagan Strom. I would fight any storm for you. Thank you to Glee lover exclamation point. Listen, if you love Glee, I'll watch Glee. (laughs) Thank you, J1308-2004. Honestly, an iconic year for music. Thank you to KTBug143, my second favorite bug. Thank you to Mills318. I appreciate the paper you've given us. Thanks to JB from San Diego. Surf's up, baby. Thanks, Kiwi. Kaylin, listen, I would suffer an itchy tongue for you. Thanks, Elizabeth, 371020. Even though you're the 371,020th Elizabeth, you're number one in our hearts. Thank you to Bug's number one fan. Oh my God, Bug is your number one fan. Thank you to Cat22324, one of the top cats in the game. The only one Bug wouldn't be scared of, I bet. Thank you to avocados are tasty and zesty. Listen, your avocado might have frankly gone bad, but if it's tasty to you, it's I'll eat whatever you're making. Thank you to Macasax. Even better than a Mac attack. Thank you to Casey12388994. I rest my case, C. Thank you to... Kristen M underscore 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 three. Third times Kristen's the charm. Thank you to E Raggy. Listen, I'll let you rag on us any day. Thank you to La 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 Lauren. What a beautiful song. Thank you to Future Funny Gal. Baby, you're funny to me already. 
Thank you to KD Mitch Seven. I hope you get to throw out the first Mitch at a baseball game soon. <laughs> Thank you to SJ2020. I'm so excited for your perfect vision. Thank you to Mimi8988. Do you know my parents almost named me Mimi? We would have been the same. Thank you, Jazz Lewis, my favorite genre of jazz music. Thanks, Gray C, the most graceful review I've ever seen. Thanks, Hugless. Listen, I'm not a hug person, but spiritually, I embrace you. Thank you, Little Miss Fuego. You are absolutely on fire to me. And do Lee, thank you so much for doing this review. Hallie, eight exclamation point. My, the, I'll be the Annie to your Hallie. Thanks, Cami Yammy 11. Nothing better than a classic Cami, baby. Thanks, Voss Hova. And even better than Hova than Jay Z. Miranda Cosgrove's biggest fan ever won. Listen, Miranda Cosgrove seems actually like a gem. And so I'm on board with you. Brie, podcast lover, thank you for loving this one. Raising Helene, thank you for being the Kate Hudson I've always dreamed of. Cass BX, thank you to Pink Flaming Ho. You are the most beautiful ho I've ever seen. Thank you to Prison Russo, my favorite member of the Wizards of Waverly Place. Thanks to Sid Ken, the other Ken to my Barbie. Sam BT, thanks for giving us this little behind the scenes. Seymour 493, my favorite old Seymour. And that's all for this week. Thank you guys so much. I adore you.